So, Loyal, one of the things that I, um, I think in every pro evening program that I do, typically I'll preach on a Sunday morning, or Connie, I'll preach at a different church on a Sunday morning, and then I always do uh, a free follow-up program in the evenings. It's typically about an hour long and then half hour Q&A. And I've got a quote that I use from Religion is Not About God. The most profound insight in the history of humankind is that we should seek to live in accord with reality. Indeed, living in harmony with reality may be accepted as a formal definition of wisdom. If we live at odds with reality, foolishly, then we will be doomed. But if we live in proper relationship to reality, wisely, then we will be saved. Uh, and then you go on to say something like, all cultures have had at least a tacit understanding of this fundamental principle. What we're less in agreement about is how we should think about reality and what we should do to put ourselves into harmony with it. Mm -hmm. And so the way I typically introduce this book, Religion is Not About God, the subtitle, How Spiritual Traditions Nurture Our Biological Nature and What to Expect When They Fail. I like to say that religion is not about God, religion is about our relationship to reality and that if religions are failing in helping us live in right relationship to what's fundamentally inescapably real, then they are failing really in their evolutionary purpose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so then you go on and you the, the middle part of your book is where you actually take a number of different religious traditions and then take a look at how they provided personal wholeness, social coherence, mm -hmm. how they helped uh, you know, really provide a mythic map of what's real and what's important or how things are and mm -hmm. those things matter. So anything that you'd like to say about what motivated you to write that book and sort of what's the, like if you were to tell people, you know, what's the essence? If somebody says, well, Loyal, tell me, what's this book, Religion is Not About God? What do you mean by that? What's yeah. that book about? Yeah. Well, I, I, uh, I think this book was inevitable from my childhood. I grew up in a very traditional uh, religious family, and uh, we thought my father was, had been a pastor. Um, my mother spent much of her career uh, in the headquarters of the Lutheran Church. Uh, so religion was always there, ever-present. Um, and so I thought a lot about it and kept on thinking about it, and eventually uh, I knew that I would try to formulate some sort of global theory of religion, and that's what this book tries to do. Yeah. It tries to explain what religion is. And I, I picked this title, Religion is Not About God, I, to emphasize what it's not about rather than what it is about. Mm -hmm. What it is about is us. Uh, and it's about um, basically um, helping us, working with the strings of human nature, uh, to try to uh, enhance our ability to achieve personal wholeness and social coherence, personal fulfillment and social cooperation simultaneously. Yes. Uh, so here's the evolutionary view. My view is that um, our, our chances are enhanced, our chances of survival are enhanced to the extent that we can achieve personal fulfillment and social cooperation simultaneously. Correct. To the extent that we do that, we optimize our chances for survival. And religious, of course, our, our inherited uh, emotional systems, drive systems, and so on, um, do a lot to help us achieve those things. Uh, but in uh, a cultural setting, we need uh, additional resources, and the story provided, or the myth provided by religion, uh, provides us with additional resources for managing our nature. Um, so that we can achieve those things. So basically, and of course this will offend some people, but basically I think that religion is therapy and politics. Therapy, uh, that is religion, appeals to the needs of individuals for personal wholeness, and the politics part uh, appeals to our need for, uh, for uh, social coherence. That, that in a way, uh, reflects uh, a long-standing tradition in Christianity that talks about, Christianity talks about the two natures of Christ, but it also talks about the two roles of the Christ figure, the priestly role and the prophetic role. Mm. The priestly role um, is what I mean by therapy, and the prophetic role is what I mean by politics. So there is the personal and the public. Mm -hmm. um, and if there's one language, a unified vocabulary that can that we can appeal to to help us enhance our therapy and our politics using one language, then we're in good shape. If we can do that, 
we optimize our chances uh, yeah. for survival. So religion is about um, the biological imperative to survive. Yeah. Survive at, at both at the level of the individual, but the level of the, the multicellular organism you that you, call you the community. You don't get uh, a social order without a personal order. You don't get a personal. You don't get yeah. personal wholeness without social right. coherence. You don't get social coherence without personal wholeness. These two things uh, support each other, but they also compete with each other because the the personal side, right, the individual always wants more of the common uh, of the commons uh, than it has a right to. And the social order, the state, always asks for more from the individual than the individual really can. They'll bleed you dry. Uh, so these are at war with each other, but they need each other. So they're mutually um, uh, beneficial, but also there's a tension. Uh, yeah, lots of tension between yeah. them. But if we can achieve those two, and of course it's constantly in flux, mm -hmm. but if we can achieve those two things simultaneously, right. uh, then we have a good chance of survival. And our chance of achieving these two things simultaneously is enhanced by having one vocabulary that can address both the personal and the political. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember reading uh, over the over a decade ago now John Stewart's book *Evolution's Arrow*, where he talked about the necessity of aligning self-interest at multiple levels, so that an individual pursuing its own self-interest is simultaneously pursuing the self-interest of the social whole that they're mm -hmm. part of, mm -hmm. and by pursuing the social whole, they get the emotional benefits and the and the you know sort of the personal wholeness mm -hmm. aspect, mm -hmm. and that a system is well designed when that, is, when that happens, and a system is dysfunctionally designed when uh, I can pursue my own self-interest and get really wealthy at the expense of the larger community that mm -hmm. I'm a part of. And mm -hmm. that's, of course, where we are now, is we've got an economic and political system where it's possible for an individual or a corporation to get wealthy mm -hmm. by toxifying the air, water, soil, and life upon which we all depend. Mm -hmm. So it's a fundamental design flaw. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things you talk about in there, actually, you mentioned a little bit also in everybody's story, the, the uh, ancillary strategies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in addition to having a mythic map of what's real and what's important, or how things are, which things matter, <clears throat> that bring these sort of, as you say, therapy and politics together mm -hmm. for personal wholeness and social coherence, there are other things that come along that allow that or facilitate the, the mythos, the story, the, the, uh, the sort of the root metaphor, the nature of reality mm -hmm. and how to live in right relationship mm -hmm. with it. Say a little bit about some of these, uh, you know, I think there were five of them. Uh, yeah, I, well I think, um, you might think of a religious tradition as, um, as a house that's been tacked together uh, feebly. It keeps falling apart, you have to keep putting it back together. Uh, an image I like even better uh, comes from my college days. In the summer I used to work on construction crews as a laborer. And we had this foreman who used to just hate it when when the laborers would stand around waiting for the delivery of the concrete truck or waiting for the delivery of some lumber to shipment or some iron or something. So we, if there was no work to do, we'd just stand around. He hated to see people getting paid for standing around. And so he used to get a hose and a bunch of brooms and he'd put the hose on, on some concrete or parking lot or wherever he could find some concrete and he put the hose out there and tell us laborers to sweep it into a pile. <laughs> <laughs> so we would sweep, 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 sweep this water uh, which kept threatening to plane out. We had to try to sweep that into a pile. That's what a religious tradition is like. It's like um, sweeping water into a pile because there's so many things that want to tear the tradition down. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I view these ancillary strategies. If you look at religion, um, and what you see is music and worship and stuff like that. So, uh, and these I take to be strategies for holding together the central story. Mm -hmm. The story itself uh, is the essence of the religious tradition and these activities that you see empirically uh, are activities that are intended to keep the story alive and keep it transmitted. And those strategies or supporting strategies or ancillary strategies, what, call them what you will, uh, are intellectual. For example, there are always philosophers and theologians or thinkers 
um, in a story tradition that will help to clarify the story, mm -hmm. uh, to interpret the story, and to defend it against criticism from the outside. So that's mm -hmm. the intellectual part. Mm -hmm. There's the aesthetic part, which is um, the artful uh, presentation of the story, which in, it draws people in. Uh, there is the institutional part. Somebody's got to decide uh, if there are going to be meetings and who's going to preside over the meetings and somebody's got to decide when two warring factions start to um, disagree with each other. There has to be some sort of polity that mm -hmm. uh, settles disagreements and so on. That's the institutional part. Uh, and then there's the, uh, I mentioned the aesthetic part, the ritual part. The mm -hmm. ritual part is uh, activities that enable people to, um, to bring the experiences of the person, of the individual, into line with the experiences of the group or the experience of the cosmos or whatever uh, is in the story so that a person can actually take ownership uh, of the story. And then the experiential part, every tradition wants people to have the kind of experiences that are memorable um, and, uh, and really um, create emotional markers uh, mm -hmm. so that a person can continually um, uh, refresh that story. So these are these are the things that you see when you look at a tradition and what they're doing is they're sweeping together uh, the story to keep it intact mm -hmm. so that it can be transmitted from one generation to another and from one culture to another or whatever. Yeah, and it's, it's those five things, the intellectual, the aesthetic, the ritual, uh, the institutional, and the experiential <clears throat> that I have done some reflecting, as I'm sure you have, in terms of if religious naturalism, either outside the existing religious traditions or, or and or also within the various religious traditions, really is to take off, there, need, there will need to be attention to those five mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and obviously that will be differently in terms of how Baptists and Lutherans and Catholics and Protestants and Buddhists and Quakers and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know all the different religious traditions, uh, um, Hindus and whatever, take on religious naturalism or what Ron Taylor calls dark green faith, will happen differently because they've already got some of those elements, mm -hmm. some of those five elements, right. than those of us who may be saying, okay, we're going to step outside of any existing previous religion Mm -hmm. and create or co-create or evolve a, a purely science-honoring, earth-respecting, you know, uh, form of religiosity mm -hmm. that uh, may now just be in its, in, it may just be just little seeds. It doesn't have any of those five, but 200, 300 years from now, on the other side of the great, of the great challenges coming down the pike can take off in the same way that Christianity took off in the in the collapse of the Roman Empire. You can see you can see it uh, emerging already. Uh, even as we speak, uh, there are organizations that uh, are forming in themselves. There's uh, something called the Religious Naturalist uh, Association (RNA) uh, that is drawing up bylaws, and uh, they have a board of directors, and they're going to you know. Um, and they're going to have a kind of mission and all the rest of it. This is organ This is the institutional aspect mm -hmm. of the new story of cosmogenesis mm -hmm. uh, forming. Um, there's the big history association. That's another. And, and these these are things that draw people in. They sign on to. And then there are there are you know mission statements. And there are you know this is what it means to belong to this thing. And so the institutional aspects. Uh, our I think there's a pantheistic, uh, world pantheism. Oh, yeah. Uh, world pantheism. Uh, yeah, so there are attempts uh, out there already to put together the institutional aspects, which will then work to add some of the other elements. There are aesthetic elements uh, that are, that are uh, uh, starting to appear. Um, and uh, yeah, so these ancillary strategies that we see in all the other traditions that are well established, mm -hmm. Uh, are in their nascent form, in their yeah. early forms, um, beginning to uh, emerge around uh, religious naturalism. Yeah. Um, so it'll be interesting to, to watch those things to develop. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, the way I've started talking about it, it are terms that aren't currently being rejected because they're, and they're not being embraced because they're just too new. There's a lot of people that haven't heard them, but they're sort of bringing together sort of sacred words and secular words in a way that is 
that I'm, uh, I'm trying to provoke people's curiosity and you know uh, so I talk about factual faith mm -hmm. or sacred realism mm -hmm. uh, in addition to religious naturalism mm -hmm. um, I also refer to it as the evidential reformation mm -hmm. that in, in Christianity you've got sort of the Catholic you know which is the authority of elders what I call religion or Christianity 1.0 mm -hmm. Christianity 2.0 the Protestant Reformation the authority of Scripture and Christianity 3.0 is the authority of evidence, the authority of global collective intelligence mm -hmm. and science. And God 3.0 moves beyond belief or disbelief. It's about honoring reality. It's about mm -hmm. honoring reality as evidentially known, mm -hmm. uh, whether you personify that or not. I think that the evidential reformation will actually end up making the Protestant Re Reformation look small in comparison because it really is about something that is likely to continue for if humanity survives for you know thousands of years um, because it's self-correcting it's self-correcting and, and, and it's grounded in big history yeah exactly. that's, that's been the problem with uh, with uh, most of the religious traditions that we have established it's that they aren't self-correct correct yes exactly yeah that, in fact this is good because this is in this conversation i'm trying to find distinctions that i can use you know i talk about the distinction between a factual god and a fictional god the fictional gods can only be experienced in the literature and in your subjective experience. I mean, Harry Potter is a fictional character. I can, I can read about Harry Potter in the literature. Mm -hmm. I can close my eyes and have an imaginary conversation with Harry Potter, but I can't experience Harry Potter with my mm -hmm. senses in the mm -hmm. real world. So God... Cecil B. DeMille offers us something. Oh, really? Okay. okay. Well, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, but God understood as a supernatural being outside the universe is, would qualify right. as a fiction. Right. Factual God is God reality personified, nature personified, time personified. Um, uh, and and then it's not a matter of believing in Poseidon or not believing in Poseidon. The seas are real, whether you Poseidon yeah, right, or right. not. You know, Eros. You don't believe in Eros or not believe in Eros. Eros is the personification of or, or erotic energy, or whatever. Yeah. Um, and so, so one question might be this: Why personify? I I think it transmits better. Does it? It transmits better. It it uh, somehow we're we're uh, we're wired. Uh, yes, for, I exactly. Mean, most of our uh, most of our sensory systems and so on are keyed to taking in information about other persons. And so, uh, if you turn your face to the sky, you're going to see people up there, um, just by nature. And so, we're able to process things a little bit better if they are personalized or yes, exactly. Yeah, how, how do we how do we um, prevent these personifications from being reified in such a way? That That's a great they, question. That they mean, carry the kind of authority yeah. that, that we loathe right. in these imaginary. Yeah, things. no, that's a great question. And I, I mean, I sometimes you know, as we shared earlier, but I'll go ahead and share now since we're not being recorded. Connie and I personify this continent as Nora. So we say we've got this intimate, personal relationship with Nora. Notice we give it a female name. Instead of North America, we say Nora. And we actually have a more juicy, yummy relationship with this continent simply by personifying this mm -hmm. continent as Nora. It probably wouldn't take more than two generations, my great-grandchildren, to say, yeah, Grandma and Grandpa, they, they, they believe that this continent has spirit called Nora. Notice they, they decouple the personification from the reality personified and then we've got now the spirit, the grandpa and grandma believed in the spirit of North America that they called Nora, as if it was the god of this continent, rather than, you know, Poseidon as the personification of the seas, not the god of the seas or the spirit of the seas. I don't know how to keep that from happening. Prior to written language, how would you hold the complex knowledge about the movement of the stars, for example, for planting, the importance yeah. of, you know, t telling time by the stars, yeah you're more likely to remember that if it's personified, if it's yeah. told in a narrative form. Yeah, it wouldn't even have to be person, actually, because there, there are other metaphors that would work. A lot of cultures have talked about the cosmos as a kind of plant, a seed that grows mm -hmm. and develops and so on. So there's a, there's a good right. metaphor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, once it has a name, then, then it can be dealt with as a reality. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And so I, I'm not trying to say that we should go back to personifying in some kind of unconscious sense. And I don't know how do we, how do we keep from reifying 
our personification. That's a problem. Yeah. But I do know that well, I do. I do suspect that we will not survive by if we continue to uh, have a disrespectful or what I come sometimes say dishonorable relationship to nature. Mm -hmm. So anything else that you because you'd actually you actually spend a, the whole middle chunk of your or about a third of your book is really on uh, taking each one of the traditions. Yeah. Um, and so, anything do you want to say? Yeah, well, <clears throat> it sort of speaks for itself. I lay out the theory of religion, and then I try to show how that is reflected within each of these five religious traditions. Uh, and then, at the end, I speculate about the future of religion. But, uh, interesting sideline here is that uh, when I was writing this book, I shared um, bits of it as I was writing with a good friend of mine, uh, Gordon Kaufman, Bless memory, um, who uh, reacted to it, um, and we had a big debate about it. I think I think I finally convinced him, so I think I finally won. But he his reaction was loyal. This is not empirical. This is not the way to do it. You have to be empirical. You have to be empirical. And and what he meant was, you study every religious tradition in the whole universe, right? And then you start to generalize from those religious traditions. And, I, and my argument was, it is empirical, but that's not the only way to do empirical, is yeah. the inductive way. You can do it uh, by, uh, by a sort of deductive method too. So my method was to start with human nature because the assumption was that uh, religious traditions uh, are nurturing our, uh, our behavioral systems. Right. Um, and so I start with an understanding of human nature, uh, put together a theory of religion, mm -hmm. and then take that theory and test it out in the field. And that's empirical. Yeah. And so if these traditions don't fit the model, mm -hmm. uh, then... Uh, so he's working ground bottom up and I'm working top, uh, yeah. top down. But he was finally convinced that it was empirical yeah. enough. And so these five chapters just try to show how uh, how each of these traditions uh, have a central mythic core that integrates cosmology and morality, mm -hmm. and that each of these traditions has um, their own versions of these strategies for maintaining and transmitting uh, the story. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so, and I picked the five that are the most obvious uh, world religions, uh, even though they aren't the largest, uh, but certainly. Christianity and Buddhism and Islam are, but uh, Judaism isn't very large. Right, exactly. Uh, but it certainly has been hugely influential. Yeah, right. Have you read um, Stuart Guthrie's Faces in the Clouds? Yeah. yeah. When did you read that? Well, I read it when it came out. Uh, because Like in 95 or something like that? Yeah, actually I read it... Did it come out in 95? 94, I think. Yeah, I think it was 94, because I was, when I was preparing By the Grace of Guile, yes, my editor, Cynthia Reed at Oxford Press, she was also vetting Stuart Guthrie's book, um, Faces in the Clouds, and so she sent it to me. I okay. don't remember if she sent it to me in manuscript form oh, or in... Yeah. in uh, in, in uh, galley form, or what? I don't remember the form, but mm -hmm. I read it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think before it hit the yeah. the stand. So yeah. yeah, yeah, because I've found that I mean the, I've been the way I've been speaking about it lately is that I would argue that the most significant scientific discovery about religion in the last hundred years is that our brains are inherently relational, and the primary way that we relate is through. Uh, personifying, right, and, right. and, that, and that's what gives us that I thou respectful relationship. Yeah. And so, when I, one of the ways I interpret a mythia is that we have been lacking not only a coherent myth, but we've been lacking a honorable relationship with nature right, because we've right. just been treating it as a myth. Right. So, that was the only piece that I found in Religion is Not About God that I, I, I would have wanted sort of a little more integration because it seemed clear that you had been familiar with Guthrie, yeah, yeah. You, but. But I, uh, because personification is so, yeah. not just central to my own understanding of the nature of religious, the, you know, religious consciousness, but also the whole field of evolutionary religious studies now, um, uh, even the evangelicals uh, within that community, which are not a lot, but the, you know, a, a few of them, Justin Barrett, for example, um, doesn't deny the centrality of 
anthropomorphism or right. personification for understanding the nature of religion. Right. And I find that a, a huge advance um, um, rather than thinking of gods or spirits or, or whatever as disembodied entities or just fictions, mm -hmm. uh, that they're personifications of some aspect of our inner or outer reality. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I, I mean, it's pretty clear from an evolutionary point of view why, why that is, because nothing in our environment really is more consequential in terms of benefit yes. and threat yes, exactly. than other persons, yes, exactly. conspecifics. Yeah. Um, that's not true of every species, but it certainly is of ours. <laughs> and uh, and so we are keyed to picking up all kinds of yeah. clues from the that will help us predict the behavior of others. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. When you think about it, we are the first culture to ever not have an honorable relationship to that reality. We treat it just as the sun. Every culture that I don't can you can you give me a counterexample of any culture that didn't in some way relate to that as a divine being of some sort? If we dishonor the sun, we're fucked. If we're, if oh we, no, of course, no question about it. Yeah. And that's why Earth and Sun, uh, you yeah. know, I mean, there's sort of natural realities yeah. we've been lacking a respectful, honorable yeah. relationship to a humble, like what yeah. we were talking about earlier. Yeah. We don't have humility before that reality. We don't have humility yeah. about this reality, and I think yeah. that's one of our problems. Yeah, we put on sunglasses and sunscreen and so we protect <laughs> ourselves. Right. Well, in a, cl in a heating world, I think we will gain that humility again. It'll be forced upon us. Yeah, I, I, I quite agree. I think. Um, Look, what <clears throat> what I don't do anymore is write books. I've, I've done that. I started repeating myself. And I uh, I write mumbles now. Poetry? What do you mean by mumbles? Well, mumbles, that, and that's what old men do. They mumble. <laughs> and, 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 and mumbles are not intended to be heard by the public. And so it's just sort of talking to themselves. And right, so right. If I'm inspired to write um, a mumble while I'm chopping wood or something, I'll come inside here and I'll... Sit down and write a mumble. And one of the mumbles I wrote, I'm not going to share my mumbles with you, but one of the mumbles had to do with, with, uh, <clears throat> this didn't really happen, but it sort of happened okay. uh, over time. It's a sort of composite uh, uh -huh. of events, but the event effectively happened. When, when I was a child, my mother, uh, when Thanksgiving came along, she would, uh, we would be at Thanksgiving dinner, and she would ask each one of us, to name what we were thankful for. And uh, so we would say, oh, I'm thankful for our food, I'm thankful for the house, and I'm thankful for loving mm -hmm. and, um And so we would go around. And of course, the next thing was that she would uh, then remind us that without the bounty of the Lord God Almighty, we wouldn't have any of these things. And so really, we're thankful to God for, for all these things. And so one year, at Thanksgiving dinner, my mother asked us to go around the table and, and say what we were thankful for. And my eldest brother uh, paused for quite a while and then finally said, the Big Bang. And my next elder brother uh, took his turn and said, gravity. And then my sister said, radiation. And I said, friction. And mother said, nothing at all. <laughs> well, that, that, that didn't happen that way. Exactly. But, but it happened, a, you know. Yeah, okay. no, exactly. So that's, that's a mumble.